We are sponsored by Hollywood Vegas 90210, also known as Vegas 90210. Lieutenant Frank, as hired by a California Highway Patrol lieutenant for a birthday party last Saturday. Lieutenant Frank, Hollywood Cap, Beetlejuice, Ron Burgundy, more about your Halloween or other holiday parties, not to mention grand openings, surprise deliveries, or singing telegrams. Got any characters of Vegas 90210? Book one today at Vegas90210.com. Hey, you want $5? While supporting this podcast, try Cash App. I did. So did my CHP birthday lieutenant. He linked a debit card and sent at least $5 via Cash App. In fact, he paid his deposit to hire Lieutenant Frank with Cash App. Then $5 was instantly added to his Cash App account. Use my code WKXRVBX to support me and earn your $5 with Cash App available in your app store. Do you like free stuff? Want free stuff while also supporting this podcast? Then head on over to MarkRomanEmpire.com and click support. Discover free stuff from companies like Coffee Bean, Uber, and Lyft. Plus, groovy products and services from all our sponsors. Healthy lists that keep growing. Before you buy anything, make sure your purchases count. Take advantage of select offers while knowing you are helping me record one more podcast. MarkRomanEmpire.com Click support. Should we start the podcast? Yeah, I'm just not sure about that. Well, I am. Just do it. You're nobody till some but he loves you. Spreading the news like mayonnaise on toast. The policy of truth. Gary, I have a mission for you. He's spanning down, loading up and truck him. Flex capacitor. Da, hook it, okay. But let me tell you about that time I drove a cab. Money that's something. Chicks that read, I want my Mark TV. Um, first, you're not on TV. Uh, podcast. Now, that is some weird and wild stuff. Did you know that, Ed? Yes! Oh, please don't drop me home. Because it's not my home, it's their home, and I'm welcome no more. Ah, oh, well, Robin attended Juilliard. I attended Hillsdale. I'm a graduate of the San Francisco Comedy College. I've traveled the Midwest quite extensively. I lived through the big short and had a pretty good time doing that. I've seen Pat Robertson jabber about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it. Not so much of the fact you're talking to a subversive. So what do you think? Do you think I'm qualified? <laughs> oh, well, I think we'll need to pray about that and ask your father. Shut up, Marilyn! Just eat it. Just eat it. The Mark Roman Empire. Also, a podcast. It's showtime! This is episode 11, but I can't hum the theme to Stranger Things. Believe me, I tried. So, something a little overdue. Tell me something, girl. Are you happy in this modern world? Or do you need more? Is there something else you're searching for? That was my Markioki bite. It's a little sound bite. Of Shallow by Brad Cooper and Lady Gaga from the film A Star Is Born, which, if you haven't yet seen, please stop drop-kicking puppies and tossing kittens into your infinity pool. Iron Man is here today. Not Tony Stark. Paul Lewis Harrell. He is a fellow busker with stories to tell. 
Stories the city of Los Angeles and Mitch, oh, where are you? May not want you to hear. He's also a fellow sag after actor and a Southern gentleman indeed. He's got roles in some notable TV and film projects in development, and he was one of the few cast members mentioned in that Hollywood Reporter article. You know the one. Twin Peaks star Sherilyn Fenn joins Rudolph Valentino biopic Silent Life. Oh, hi there. I'm Mark Roman. Mark who? Mark Roman. You know, like the Empire. We'll chat with Paul in a moment. Uh, We are back for our second week here at the World Famous Musicians Institute, MI, here in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard, carefully nestled between a Tom Cruise Scientology hostel and a place serving not half bad Mediterranean cuisine on your way to the Ripley's Believe It or Not tourist trap. We are safely within stumbling distance of the legendary Pig and Whistle, as well as Jameson's Irish Pub, where everyone knows Lieutenant Frank's name. Ollie, my faithfully proper British companion, is dutifully hovering over the soundboard at this very moment. You know, it really is all Ollie's fault. I even have a podcast. Thank you, Ollie. Book him, Dano. Oh, shut up, Marilyn. Some quotes from An Enemy of the People by Henrik Ibsen this week, courtesy of our good friends over at Goodreads, who are good enough to follow my Twitter, at the Mark Roman. You see, the point is that the strongest man in the world is he who stands alone. I'm sorry. He who stands most alone. The majority is never right. Never, I tell you. That's one of those lies in society that no free and intelligent man can help rebelling against. Who are the people that make up the biggest proportion of the population? The intelligent ones or the fools? You should never wear your best trousers when you go out to fight for freedom and truth. The most dangerous enemy of the truth and freedom amongst us is the compact majority. A party is like a sausage machine. It grinds up all the sorts of heads together. And I'm sorry, let's do that one over again. A party is like a sausage machine. It grinds up all sorts of heads together into the same baloney. There is so much falsehood, both at home and at school. At home, one must not speak. And at school, we have to stand and tell lies to the children. The idol of authority must be shattered in this town. A community is like a ship. Everyone ought to be prepared to take the helm. Well, there we go. Since the fake tycoon with the orange shroom likes to call the press the enemy of the people, I thought I'd read a little Ibsen there, like I did back in college, before they kicked me out for being the student press. Anyway, I thought I'd read some Ibsen, you know. Someone has to. So what the hell is it, like, open season on journalists or what? Washington Post writer James Khashoggi is killed by Saudis in Istanbul. Today, a bomb was found at CNN's New York office. Uh, Actually, a lot of bombs in a lot of places today. Here in L.A., a mail center was evacuated over a bomb addressed to member of Congress Maxine Waters. This is what America Made Great looks like? Wow. Wow. The fake tycoon with the orange shroom worries about MS-13 amid the caravan of starving poor immigrants in Central America heading north. Got news for you, shroom. MS-13 is already here. They tagged the Jimmy Kimmel Theater on Sunday. True story. And I'll tell you that story here in a minute. You guys know the Mark Roman Empire, also a podcast, is sponsored by... 
Mark Roman Empire swag. My poem, Son of Elmer Gantry's Bitch, autographed, only $15. Lieutenant Frank citations, previously issued to a real FBI agent for being Scully, as well as David Spade, Kelly Clarkson, and Joe Jonas. Also issued to 9,116 others. Lieutenant Frank citations, only $9. And let's not forget, Lieutenant Frank headshots, autographed, only $25. Simon Cowell got one for his work with Duran Duran. No, I, I know. You go ahead and tell Lieutenant Frank, okay? Hey, buy my poem, Citation or Headshot today, and get free shipping within the continental United States at markromanempire.com. Click Swag Merch Groovy. We're also sponsored by Ella Dawn Designs. Hey, there's got to be a better way to travel with your shoes. Now there is. The trademarked Ultimate Shoe Bag by Ella Dawn Designs. Travel your shoes easier. Up to eight pairs at a time, many styles to choose. To view the commercial and demo video, go to elladawndesigns.com. Hey, save 10% when you use discount code ROMAN at checkout. Elladawndesigns.com. Tiger's blood winning. This week's Mark Roman Empire, also a podcast. Best listener contest passphrase is... Paul Lewis Harrell is the man. So let me tell you a story of Captain America on a sunny Sunday walking all the way to Hollywood Division. That's right. I got mad, guys. I got mad. This is my neighborhood, and I'm I'm looking at... Uh, I'm standing in front of the Dolby Theater. Okay, I'm Captain America. I'm busking. It's Sunday. I don't have a tailgate, so I'm doing that. I'm looking straight ahead, and someone has spray painted with white paint on the brick that supports the middle column uh, of the uh, the uh, what do you call it? It's like the Shriners Hall or the Mason Temple or whatever. It's where Jimmy Kimmel does his podcast. All right, right next door to the El Capitan. And someone in, in white is spray painted MS 13. They tagged my hood. I'm sorry. I just, that's unacceptable to me. And what was most unacceptable to me wasn't the fact that someone tagged it, it was the fact that someone got away with it on a Sunday. Broad daylight, tourists out everywhere. What was not out everywhere to be seen? anyone from LAPD. So I hope no one got assaulted or no one <laughs> had their purse snatched because uh, there's nobody there to do anything about it. And it's been that way for a long time. And it's it's really, really upsetting to me. So I, even though I needed to, to work, uh, I just decided, wow, you know what? I'm going to start walking until I find either a uniformed LAPD officer or I find a cruiser that I can flag down and report this crime because clearly no one else has because it's still there. So I walk and I walk. I walk down Hollywood Boulevard. I go past Highland. I go past uh, uh, Pig and Whistle. Uh, I get to Wilcox. I turn right on Wilcox. I haven't seen any LAPD. I haven't seen any LAPD cars, no officers, nothing. I keep going down. I go past the post office. I go past that uh, cool place. I forget what it's called, but it's got the bar on the top of the roof that I think has a pool, but it doesn't have a pool. But it's got cool festive drinks, and I went there uh, a while back. And I went there with uh, Anne Marie Evans who uh, has got a cool script running around town. So if you're looking for a cool TV production, you might want to check under a script, ask her about it. Anyway, I keep walking. I go past uh, Sunset, through Sunset. I go past the Staples. I go past that cool little movie house that's across the street from the Staples that you wouldn't even know is there, but it's there. And I get to within a block of the LAPD Hollywood division where they film Bosch. Finally, 
I see a police cruiser. But it, it, it makes a right. It, it gets the fuck out of Dodge. And I'm already here. I'm all sweaty because it was like in the mid 80s. I'm in my, my uh, Captain America suit, okay? I'm like just sweats just dripping down my brow. I'm pissed. I walk into the station as Captain America. What do you think's going to happen? So I talk to uh, whoever the, uh, the corporal was. He had two stripes, okay? Sorry, I don't know how the how the the lingo with the ranks go with LAPD, but to me he was a corporal, and he's he's got the look on his face already, like you know, like this is a bad joke, you know, like Captain America, and uh, you know a bumblebee wander into a, an LAPD Hollywood division. It's like what what what's the punchline here? Clearly, I'm the punchline. That is how I was made to feel. Very quickly, very easily. I said, I'm here to report a crime. Someone tagged the Jimmy Kimmel Theater with MS-13. And it, the eyes are just rolling in the back of their heads, okay? These LEPD officers. And I realize, all right, I just, I need to get some documentation here that I reported this. Otherwise, I, I wasted my time and my sweat. I got to get something out of this. So... I finally end up talking to a lieutenant, apparently the highest ranking person there, and I'm, it, it comes to my attention that apparently there's only seven units in the entire Hollywood division on a Sunday with all these tours out and about, and none of them are available to, uh, to be in what's called the Hollywood Entertainment District, which is between Orange and Highland. Uh, and the, the corporal, the guy with two stripes, he looks at me, and he gives me that look that I know from buddies of mine who are cops, and it's the, they're, they're going in the zone. I know exactly what that zone is. You're talking to a perp. You know they're guilty. You don't exactly yet know how, but you're going to find out, and you're going to trip them up in a lie. And that's exactly the energy this guy was throwing off. I know I just couldn't recognize it, all right? And he goes, you know, what are we supposed to do? We got a cruiser up on a court up in the Hollywood Hills. We're supposed to take that down and have that one be assigned to, uh, to Hollywood Boulevard. And I'm thinking, wow. So the first go-to for this, this uniformed LAPD cop at Hollywood Division is that he, there's an equivalency between a tiny court up in the Hollywood Hills. And how many people are there? Let's assume there's a full-blown party at 1 p.m. on a Sunday going on in each of those houses. Does that equal the number of, of tourists, locals, and employees of businesses that are packed on a typical weekend on Hollywood Boulevard with the Hollywood and Highland Mall, with the Dolby Theater where they have the Academy Awards, with the Chinese Theater, TCL Chinese Theater, formerly Mance, with the Jimmy Kimmel uh, Theater across the street, with the uh, El Capitan Theater right next door, and all the different businesses and tourist traps and restaurants, the Hootas, all right, the, uh, the friggin' the kids' place, uh, uh, Dave and Buster's, all that stuff. That, that's equivalent? What the fuck? Are you kidding me? Like, I, I wish I had the resources where I just stop everything and go interview every single property owner in my neighborhood and go up on those hills. Everywhere in Hollywood Division, I want to ask every single property owner, how much do you pay in property taxes? How much do you pay your accountant to get out of paying taxes? Because this is what your tax dollars are getting. Nobody's safe on Hollywood Boulevard. And that nobody is not just me as a busker. It's these tourists that come from around the world to have a wonderful experience. And it fucking pisses me off. The utter lack of protection that my city, the city of angels, provides human beings who flocked to this tourist destination to have a wonderful, memorable time with their family. What the hell are you doing, Garcetti? What the hell are you doing, Mitch? Oh, where are you? What the fuck is going on? Now, I get it. I'm a busker. I'm the lowest peg on the totem pole, okay? So with that in mind, fast forward a day or two, and I'm on LinkedIn. And I got, I think, like about 1,400 some odd connections right now. But someone wants to be the uh, the next connection. So they do... Uh, 
invitation, friend request, whatever they call it on LinkedIn. And they got a little message and it says, I have the perfect day job for entertainers. If you're interested into finding out more, let's connect. I would love to tell you more about it. This is from a guy named Courtney Fast. In, he's a business development manager at Blue Dog. This is how I respond. I send him a message. I don't accept his friend request. I just sent him a, a message. Courtney, wow. Um, thanks. I regret to inform you, I don't seek a day job. I remain a professional entertainer. I recognize many white collar Americans consider working artists as slaves and prefer their art for free. That's quite tragic and upsetting. Please reassure me that you don't do that. However, if you have an idea that involves my art, I might entertain your proposal. Good luck. And may your path be trod by less evil feet. And I give them a link to uh, markromanempire.com, the uh, the won't you be my vendor link because I get a lot of solicitations. So I figured I'd direct them there. Can you believe this shit? I'm sorry. The whole idea of a day job for people in the entertainment world, whether they're an actor or something else, a musician, it's insane. What the hell are you doing, America? Do you know an attorney who needs a day job? Do you know a doctor who needs a day job? Do you know an investment banker who needs a day job? I remember being a mortgage broker. I don't remember a mortgage broker needing a day job. You, you see where see where I'm coming from here? Okay. I just I'm I'm I resent the way this country treats working artists. It fucking pisses me off. Okay? Are we clear? I think I have a right to that anger, that 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 justifiable, holy righteous rage. Okay? I'm sorry. When when you work at Wells Fargo and you're literally stealing from your customers and you get caught red-handed and nobody goes to jail, why am I supposed to respect your quote day job as a banker or a manager or an executive? Or somebody who sits on the board of directors of Wells Fargo. Capiche? All right. Or Khashoggi, who got assassinated by Saudi Arabia, who buys lots of arms from companies like, oh, I don't know, Boeing here in Southern California. I used to date a rocket scientist from Boeing. She called me her, quote, AMW, actor, model, whatever. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of us giving respect to shitty assholes who do horrible things to other human beings. And yet, by in the same breath, we treat working artists like they're the scum of the earth. Why do I say that? I'll work as a busker. Someone will demand to get a photo with me. I don't demand that people get photos with me. If people want to, great. If they don't, then I haven't done my job as a working artist. People will demand to get a photo with me because people like what I do. I make people laugh. It's not hard for me. It's what I do. And that's in demand. People want it. So they come up to me. They will tap me on the shoulder. They'll stop me and go, please stop. I want to get a photo with you. And I say, I would love to do that. I do photos for tips. They laugh at me. Not everyone, but a lot of people who are typically white men who graduated from a university they're really proud of. And I'll say, yeah, no, I don't get a salary to be here doing what I'm doing. I'd be happy to do a photo with you. I do it for tips. They laugh again. I say, no, really, it can be anything. It doesn't even have to be cash. I accept credit cards and payment apps. They laugh again harder as if that's the most ridiculous ridiculous thing that's ever been suggested to them. 
the idea that a working artist could be a professional and have access to the same sort of tools that any other business owner or professional might access. If I ran into this just one time, you wouldn't hear me talking about it. When I run into it over and over and over again every week, that's why you're hearing about this. All right? So, sorry. Can we have fun now? Let's have some fun. Let me tell you about Taylor Vaughn. Oh, my God. She is awesome. She just had her release party. Uh, I didn't have a chance to talk about it last week. This happened about two weeks ago. But it's good because now she is on uh, iTunes, her new album. Uh, I think she's also on Stitcher and Spotify. Not Stitcher. I think just Spotify, a bunch of other stuff. Um, I think it's taylorvon.com. We'll throw it in the show notes. But she is phenomenal. I know her because of her dad. He and I uh, go back in the... Bay Area days. Uh, Ashley was a friend of his that helped me get to LA in the first place. Um, long story I'll tell another time. But uh, Taylor Vaughn, brand new album out. She is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I see her having a great future uh, as a musician, as a singer-songwriter. And I think you might want to check it out yourself and see, see, uh, see what you think. Because she put a smile on my face. I think she might put a smile on your face. Uh, and if we need smiles on our faces, this is definitely a week we all could use a little more of that. Um, a funny thing happened on the way to me uh, complaining about MS-13 tagging uh, Jimmy Kimmel's theater. Uh, Pretending is a Texas cover band of the Pretenders, and they contacted me, or they liked my MS-13 post, and I'm like, well, who are these guys? And I looked into it, and uh, I guess they start with the Bay Area, and I think they're in Texas now. Um, but they are awesome. Oh my God. They're, they're a lead singer. She really captures, uh, the mojo, not just the voice, but the mojo and swagger, uh, Chrissy Hines. So you guys got to check that out. We'll have a link of that in the show notes too. uh, pretending the cover band of the pretenders they are phenomenal. And I would love to have them on the podcast. All right. Sorry guys. It was a little, little improv here this week. How to get some stuff off my chest. Can, can you tell? <laughs> Let's see. The week Twitter posts. Uh, these are at, at the Mark Roman. Uh, I had a Twitter post about why I hate my internet provider, Spectrum. Yeah, I had to deal with that today. I thought we were going to do happy stuff, Mark. Yeah. Well, I, I had ideas on sexual favors and Spectrum. That's also a tweet. Let's see. We had the tragic tale of Courtney Fast. Hashtag don't be Courtney fast, which we just talked about. So, so you can see it for yourself. Uh, the evidence. Eddie Pepitone encouragement. Uh, you can never get enough of that stuff. And don't forget, hashtag Eddie Pepitone tonight show. Haven't forgotten you, Eddie. And still want you on the podcast. Talk to me, Eddie. Weird Al on how to get a groovy free sticker. You, could, you don't have enough free stickers in your life. Weird Al will show you how. I tweet about it. Why I lack confidence in the authorities in my neighborhood. I kind of talked about it a little bit today already, but there's some more info about that in the tweet. And lastly, a tweet of the week of mine, hashtag why I write my contribution. Instagram. I got posts over there. It's a Vegas 90210 tailgating question. But my city was gone by a government that had no pride. And finally, the, on a fun note, and a holiday note, the new Hollywood Odd Couple, Halloween flavored. Where can you see me next? Well, there might be some Lieutenant Frank cameos on Hollywood Boulevard. There haven't been a lot lately, but uh, I kind of feel like mixing things up. So you might, you might see that. He might be in his jacket, though. It's getting a little chilly out there. Lieutenant Frank at Football Tailgates. Uh, I know there's a lot this weekend, but this will drop after that. Uh, following weekend, there's none. Nothing on the calendar. Nada. So, got to wait another week if you want those uh, Football Tailgates Lieutenant Frank action. I can't wait either. Hollywood Cap on Hollywood Boulevard with the Hollywood Avengers. Uh, that includes Hollywood Iron Man, uh, the new one. Uh, Hollywood Wolverine and Hollywood Spidey. You'll see that... Uh, a little bit this weekend. I'm going to be gone a lot, though, with the tailgates. Um, but this weekend, the more next weekend, more next weekend. This is dropping Monday. 
You can listen to the podcast on Mixcloud, Podbean, Stitcher, TuneIn, and YouTube at Mark Roman Empire. On SoundCloud, we are Mark Roman Podcast. And MarkRomanEmpire.com is the best place to go that has all the links, plus rolling new grooviness. So my guest today, Paul Lewis Harrell. We live in the same neighborhood. Uh, we're fellow buskers. We're also fellow SAG uh, after actors. And it's kind of fun because, uh, well, he plays uh, Iron Man. I play uh, Captain America. Uh, I'm wearing a blue shirt and a blue hat. He's sporting a, a, a red hat. You'll see it in the photos. It's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, we had a meeting in the minds. And I got to know Paul a little better. Uh, I'd like you to uh, as well. It was a fun conversation. Check it out. Let's check in with Paul here. I'm here with Paul. Paul, how you doing, brother? Good, good. How are you, Mark? I'm fantastic. It just, you know, this is the 11th episode, so we're like working out new things each time. There's new stuff. Like you, you, you had some very professional questions, which I really appreciated. Like you asked me, should I turn my phone off? Which, you know, hashtag actor's life. That's a sign you've been on set. I quite would rather a bit. do selfies and and you know snapping, um, all that other annoying stuff that you know post cool. on social media it's you know, cool reveal the plot spoilers immediately before it airs yep. all that kind of stuff yeah. get in trouble with execs it's nice and nice so i appreciate that brother i appreciate that so what i want to do i'm gonna because there's a lot of stuff that uh we can go into you know uh, obviously we've got to let's talk about, not <laughs> oh, <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah hey all right that's it folks that was a great interview we did the shortest one here you're Woo-hoo! welcome for the sake of got brevity that job done quick boys right. Let's definitely want to get into Iron Man, but okay. there's also a lot of really cool stuff going on with, uh, since you are a fellow SAG after actor, mm-hmm. uh, you got a lot of really cool things uh, in production um, and stuff that you've already done and stuff that I know is in development. So definitely want to get into that. But let's start at the beginning if we can, because okay. you are a bit of a, a Southern gentleman who hails from where in Kentucky? Um, let me think about this. Do you, do you need? Well, uh, and I was born in Louisville, have, and I was raised in Bardstown. So. Bards. Okay, I've heard of Louisville. Louisville. Uh, Louisville. 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 Okay. Louisville. Louisville. But Bardstown, I'm not. Bring me up uh, to speed here. Bardstown is uh, named after basically Stephen Foster, which is the uh, the guy. He's a you know um, an all American uh, folk writer that wrote. Uh, oh wow. Stephen Foster's um, um, basically uh, my old Kentucky home. Okay. Which is the house that's listed on the state quarter, which is oh the sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. <laughs> I should know the whole wow, thing. Wow, that's awesome. Well, it's um, more than I know. Like, so he's he's me some he's, a tra- he's a traveling he's a traveling he's a traveling musician, and a traveling musician is a bard. So that's why it became right. Bardstown, as far as I know. So I'm sure some history buff is going to you know come out of the middle of left field and just shoot me down with a Tommy gun, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, when I hear Bard, I, I think of the Bard, William Shakespeare. But uh, that's very cool that there's a very specific Americana history there, which is kind of fitting that that would be your your hometown. Yeah, I gotta be Can honest, say, I'm, I'm uh, a little jealous. That's kind of cool. There's a Stephen Foster story, which is um, a play that they do every every year, every summer, and there's additional theater that they do there. Wow, and it's uh, they it's very. They pride it, you know, um, it draws a lot of tourism. It's one of the first four um, colonies in the New World, uh, Bardstown was. Really? It's got a lot of wow. uh, uh, old American history. Huh. Um, and uh, it's also known, coined as the bourbon capital of the world, TM. Okay, hello. And so at the time, I think when that happened, I think it was around 17 distilleries. I mean, forget about trying to count them now. I mean. Yeah. But uh, yeah. And- and what's your beverage of choice since we've approached the subject here? That would be bourbon whiskey. Okay. Okay. So you're uh But I can't I can't I can't list one because that might change my opportunity for endorsements later. <laughs> 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 you're like I have a, I have an idea, but uh, the business hasn't been settled yet, so I'm not at liberty to uh, as I think um, to divulge. Was it uh um not book or no, which is the uh, descendant of of Jim Beam. Um, but Fred No, mm-hmm. which is his his son, said there are no bad bourbons, only better ones. Okay. So I think that's that's a pretty fair statement to make, you know. 
I'm not a big bourbon guy, but I, I respect the uh, the mystique. Now, isn't there is a difference between um, here yes. it's bourbon, and then on the other side of the pond, it's called whiskey or no? Um, I, well, sorry, uh, my sound engineer Ollie here is about to here's, murder me. Here's the. Um, that's it's, why I'm asking. All right, well, it's like a first together. in, last out deal. It's like uh, no, um, bourbon is whiskey. Okay, but not all bur not all bourbon, not all whiskey is bourbon. So okay, gotcha. even though even though our our rival, you know, Jack Daniels, you know, it's it's Tennessee whiskey. Mm -hmm. It does actually meet the requirements to be called a bourbon. Okay, at least according to Wikipedia. I mean, my my Kentucky friends are gonna you know they're gonna have my head on a stick whenever <laughs> I go back for the holidays. <laughs> but um, it has to be aged for at least two years. It has all to be right. in an oak barrel. And the uh, the water uh, has to come from a limestone limestone source, and I think those are the three criteria to to make a Kentucky bourbon. I might be wrong on that, but it's something to that effect. Specific. So there's bourbon, but then there's Kentucky bourbon. It's usually bourbon's usually kind of like synonymous with Kentucky, but it's not necessarily okay. It's not necessarily. I mean, it gets kind of like somebody knows more about it than I do, but mm -hmm. I know that's. Well, I mean, this those is, three criteria. This might seem like okay. We're t you know, you're an actor. Why are we suddenly talking about bourbon? But it's funny. I just saw uh, something about Ryan Reynolds, who does Daredevil, also in the Marvel universe. Uh, and he, Ryan Reynolds does Daredevil. <laughs> oh, I'm so oh, oh, wow. I thought he did Green Lantern. Talk about hate mail. Oh man, sorry, Marvel fanboys. Just, sorry. just mail it sorry. in. All right. He doesn't Sorry, do Daredevil. Dead, he Deadpool. does Deadpool. He does Deadpool. the other D hero. Dead skin. Yeah, dead skin. <laughs> Dark Knight. <laughs> the Dark Knight. And everything else in between. But he has, uh, I think it's um, aviation, I want to say, out of Portland. It's a gin. Yeah, I saw that. That he not only heavily invested in, but now he's like the, uh, you know, their brand ambassador and helping with it. And Matthew McConaughey is doing that. Um, somewhere not far from Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. With, no, I think he's doing. Was he doing a Texas? I think he's Maker's Mark. He's a Texan. That's I right. Think he is he's Maker's doing Mark. Maker's Mark. Yeah. And then, uh, and he's using this, the catchphrases from his original films, which all is right uh, of that. Yeah, yeah. And others. I, I, I can't do a good time him in, so. yeah. But yeah, he's great. I mean, I'd, I'd I'd buy anything that he sells. You know, right? Yeah, uh, me Makers, too. Lincoln. Seriously. Well, and then um. Uh, George, uh, which George? The George, George Clooney. Yeah, the okay. richest, the richest actor in, in well, he last had year. That was at Casamigos um, tequila, which I, I heard he sold uh, for a billion dollars. Hmm. I don't know when he made that transaction, but uh, maybe it was a million. I don't know. It was okay. It was Ryan Reynolds who said that. So. Take that with a grain of salt. Okay. Yeah, he, he might have done that. When is Ron Reynolds not Deadpool? I'm just asking. I'm I just, just know and that. I ask that with love. I just know <laughs> that I saw an article, which might be completely fake news, that uh, it was Clooney, I think for 2017, was did like something around like 230 million. The Rock came in at number two at around like 150 million and Robert Downey Jr. came in at like 88 million for what okay. they made just that that year Earnings. alone. Yeah. yeah. Just that year alone. Now I'm not talking about what they've racked up over the right. period of time but um yeah, so if if that happened according to that article, it didn't happen in 2017. Might have happened this year. Might have happened 2018. It's this one this year's not over yet. So. I just saw uh, yeah, this is like I think, you know, broke like a week ago within the last week um hey let's uh before we we get washed away in all this uh this bourbon let's uh let's talk about that moment in drama club in bethlehem okay and when we say bethlehem where's bethlehem in your life bethlehem in my drama life club. is just across the street from the uh the saint joseph church which was one of the crucial parts of uh, the new uh, the new frontier, the new American frontier, where the uh, um, 
Bardstown was started, so that's part of the uh, the Proto Cathedral, et cetera. Okay, so this is in Kentucky. Yes, this is in Kentucky. This is yeah. not in the Middle East. No. Okay, this is Bethlehem. So it's because one. we don't really know that Jesus was from the Middle East, do we? So um, anyway, no, real Americans know. Let's that try Jesus, not get too political and too religious Jesus here, Mark. Is, <laughs> I just want to have an easy <laughs> podcast. I know. Hey, you're the one wearing no. the ha- red hat. Okay, but no, Bethlehem I'm wearing the blue is, hat. Uh, <laughs> is, we call it Bethlehem. It wasn't Bethlehem. We called it Bethlehem. 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 Because you know, makes sense. In the South, you just sure. like skip a lot of stuff, right? You just yeah, that's how we call it down there. Yeah. It's called Bethlehem. Yeah, casual, Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem High School. And so at I Bethlehem like High it. School, I um, that's where the Eureka moment happened with with acting. Uh, I was in so there the day before getting started for the. Uh, um, the upcoming freshman year, um, and there was proposed with the electives and everything else, and 4-H didn't stick out, you know, ROTC didn't stick out, and a drama club just kind of popped out, and I was like, oh, I could be a professional actor. What was the appeal? What drew you to it? It just popped into my head. I mean, you know, it's just like you're, you're sitting there, and I, I never really thought about it. I mean, I've always been, you know— I did um, impersonations of Robin Leach whenever he was, you know, whenever I was a little kid. I was like, that guy sounds funny. Really? Like, Hello, I'm Robin Leach of the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. You know, <laughs> uh, get that's, like it. <laughs> I haven't heard him in a while, so I get, it gets he better. He just I, passed away. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually when I was in 500. Vegas. Uh, I got a chance to meet or be around to like a lot of the local Vegas locals in the entertainment biz. Um, like they knew him. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, yeah, he just passed. I mean, the guy certainly enjoyed the lifestyle that he covered. So <laughs> sure, he, uh, sure. You know, food and drink were not, uh, were definitely not forbidden pleasures of his. Let's just put it that Well, way. he was an old guy, dude, whenever I remember being a kid, you know, yeah. in the mid, mid oh, eighties yeah. so watching him. Sure. I mean, you know, he was, he was still had silver hair at that point. Yeah. So, you know, to make it an additional, what, 30 years. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, and he uh, he's it's a lot of uh, friends of mine in in Vegas. Uh, their careers were helped by him. He was very very kind and generous, from what I've heard of my favorites on the local Vegas scene. Cool. Yeah. So all right. So drama club. You realize this is what you want to do, mm-hmm. but uh, not very long after high school, you're suddenly doing video game design. I understand what, what happened there? Well, um, it's just one of those things where like, you know, you got practicality in the world that we live in and what's that? (laughs) Mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Fair enough. Don't let them pick guitars and drive them old trucks. (laughs) Let them be doctors and lawyers and such. (laughs) So. My dad listened to that song actually, and probably took a little bit too, too I much believe to heart. You. I think <laughs> Willie was trying to trying to tell you, let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Who kind of trying, video he tried games. the reverse psychology and it just didn't work. So, gotcha. but you know, you know, we all have a a lovely path to go on. Uh, I was playing video games at. Uh, you know, prior, I think Atari, my uncle, Eric, yeah. was, Eric was playing Atari, you know, probably around, you know, it, I mean, from the get go. I mean, I guess I was old enough to where I was old enough to even remember, you know, I was watching him play, you know, Pitfall. And I'm like, oh, man, this is cool. This guy's like, I can imagine him there swinging across a rope and then getting past these alligators. It's like, this is kind of like interesting. Like, and then it we had the you. woods out back and it was like, uh, Okay, so this is an adaptation of the, what the woods is like. And then oh, there's a I pond see, okay, out here. Okay. And then imagine if there were sharks in, in the pond, which are, sharks can't live in the pond because that's you're seeing not your a freshwater fish. You're world, your backyard. Right. And later I found out landscape. that uh, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, the, um, you know, the main brainchild of, of the, the success of Nintendo going into the, the, the digital age and the, the computer video games. Right. Um, he created Legend of Zelda because he remembered being a, a young boy and he, he had stumbled upon a cave and he remembered uh, being anxious about it and having to get up the courage to get a, a, a lantern and light the lantern and go down and to explore the cave. Oh, okay. And, you know, 
being a little boy and having a stick and pretending it's a sword and, you know, <laughs> right. beating up your little sister with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or little brother. Whatever. Or, or whoever's whatever around. Whatever little you got laying around. <laughs> whatever poor little animal or, you know, so, sorry to all the animal rights activists, but we had to kind of pave the way with those poor little critters of nature. Some kids have done that. Boys yeah. are just horrible. Little demons. Mm, we fully are aware of that. <laughs> yeah. And then we get older and then the women start talking sense into us. So it kind of balances itself is, out. Is that what the women do? I, last time I checked, okay. I did. All right. They do a lot of other nice things as well. <laughs> Gosh damn it, Mark. And uh, this is suddenly becoming like a Bill Burr or Jim Jeffries episode which i'm not complaining there's nothing wrong with that but it's creative and you're taking something and you're telling a story and you're, you're building something out of nothing with and video I, games with video games you know and what i liked about it was is if i was alone and it was me in that video game i was in my own world i was imagining you know because the graphical representation at that time it was kind of like reading a book it was like an easier book to read because you're getting the stimuli, stimuli coming back in through the, the video game controller and, right. the, and, the, and the screen. And you're actually making it happen. You're making it progress. So it's an active storytelling. You're story a character telling. in the storyline, yeah. Right. It's like like they call RPGs, which is a role-playing game. Which, right. Yeah, every game is a role-playing game. So in a sense, you're, you're, you're acting in a way. Without well, you are, being you are an industry. actor. You yeah. are an actor, an agent in the game are an avatar in the game, not as the movie avatar, but an avatar means that you're 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 a a player character, right? As compared to ready player an, an one in, and an NPC, which is a non-player character. So uh, a, an NPC NPC is a non-player character. Like if say example, you've got a uh, video game and you got a guy in the town that you have to talk to, and he's the drunk that's at the bar. He's like oh da 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 da, and he rambles off something. And he somehow rambles off some oh, gotcha. password. But it, it's or not like, like that. That's another Pac-Man. guy. That's not another guy on the other end. It's just a computer. He's 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 this basically like a. Um, you know, he's a, a under five actor in the in the game that helps advance the story. You got to go really old school with me. So it's like in Pac-Man, I'm Pac-Man. That's the player. But the ghosts flying around, that's the non-player. Right. Okay. That'd be correct. Cool. Yep. So, you know, back into that and uh, going through um, Full Sail University and uh, going through... Um, and at this point, you're in Florida, right? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Orlando, Florida. Winter Park. Uh, going through uh, classes like structures of game design. Why uh, Florida? What? Uh, that's the uh, where Full Sail's based. Okay. Yeah. And now Full Sail is good for video game design. Now? They actually had film and stuff as well. Okay. They had film. They had uh, recording, like they do here at MI, and uh, um, digital media, hmm. uh, computer animation, um, show production, just to name a few. Okay. Mm hmm. Entertainment-based stuff. Gotcha. So you got a degree there? That's correct. Okay. Associate of Science in Game Design and Development. And then you, you got a job, or you started your own business? You... I hated programming. And <laughs> I, you know, I had friends of mine that already had bachelor's degrees yeah. before they came in. I came in a little bit. I didn't come directly from high school. Uh, I was like 22 okay. when I got there. So that was enough time for somebody to actually say, okay, well, I'm 18, now I'm going into college and basically be already out of college. And some people were already out of college um, that were my age, and they'd already had bachelors of science right. and, uh, you know, um, software engineering. And so they're writing stuff that's, you know, 10,000 times more complex than what I could write. And I'm just not, I'm not geared for it. You know what I mean? I'm more like. So you're realizing maybe this is not for me. Yeah, after going through that whole process, which it was a hard, it was it was very difficult. Is this uh, about the time that you discovered program. something called the Dead Walk? Yeah, somewhere around in that time, okay. I was on I was on MySpace and happened to see a thing go through, and uh, it was uh, down in Melbourne, Florida, which is a little bit south of Orlando, uh, uh, southeast, and. Uh, it was a cattle call for zombies, and I just went down there. Well, for our listeners that don't know what a cattle call is, what's uh -huh. a cattle call? Cattle call means it's just like... Um, it's a film term. It's a film term for getting everybody and their mom out there and just, you know, we'll see what happens first come, first serve. 
and uh, gets like many what kind cattle of numbers, in there. How many people typically with a cattle call? Um, this is for background actors, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was for background actors. Um, but I just wanted to go go down there and get my hands on something and and just do something and and just go where my curiosity leads, you know, and figure out how am I going to pick this back up and gotcha. Yeah. So it's cattle calls. Is that like 10 people, 20 people? No, man. They had a lot. They had a lot of people. They had like close to like 100 people. Oh, okay. They showed up so randomly. It's a big group. Yeah. That was with the yeah. original, you know, social media MySpace. I mean, they got some people to show up out there. Interesting. Yeah. Don't know how they did it. Don't even know what the algorithms were or <laughs> how they managed that with so the you old spammy. you get on the set as uh, one of these several, almost 100 background actors. And uh, what, what what did you think? I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't really thinking. I was just kind of like acting. I was not acting. I was just like doing, like I saw that they needed help and I was like, mm -hmm. you know, there was some chaos. There's a bit of chaos, you know, when you're dealing with a cattle call and um, they were like, hey, can you help us like kind of like finagle some of these guys and help people get seated where they need to get seated and oh, they recruited you to be a wrangler yeah well they okay. recruited me to be a wrangler so i picked up a, a you know production assistant credit nice. and i was just like you know i just need they needed help you, you got know on I mean? the job training yeah i got on the job training yeah. and i'm just went down there and just you know just wanted to get involved you know get involved in the process and then they gave me a special scene where um I bring down one of the uh, the leads, so it was kind of like a featured extra part where the the zombie with the afro. So now how, how, kills one of the leads. How are you feeling about the uh, the video game design? Um, I think it's great. I still uh, I don't play video games anymore. I stopped yeah. kind of playing games um, a lot after after the degree the degree because I mean you realize you have to be spending time making video games for more time than you have to do playing them. And this is like, you know, when you're an adult, when we were kids, you know, uh, you, time is a unlimited thing that you just get to do whatever you want to do with it. And you have no concept of it. You have no concept of time. Yeah. You have no concept. So you can play these, you know, 60 hour RPGs and, and you have this whole journey and have this whole fantasy novel that you've read that only you know about. And of course, other people that have played the same game. And, um, uh, you don't have any timetable, you know, right. you don't have a rent to pay, you know, it's a, that's a privilege. So you're acting though now with the, uh, the mm -hmm. dead walk. So, right. What, what, what happened between then and cause you end up in Hollywood at some point. Right. Correct. Well, after going through the dead walk, I'd had a couple other guys that were, that were messing around with film in Orlando and they had some projects they were trying to get off the ground, which as you know, Independent independent projects are very seldom to get greenlit, or uh, the lack of uh, scheduling, lack of um, many things, you know, other than someone's pipe dream actually coming to fruition. Right. You know, so I just started auditioning for for stuff on Craigslist. I actually booked another thing up in Jacksonville, Florida, where I was in um, uh, the Legend of Hammerhead, something or another. Um, I forget what exactly what the name of it was. Hammerhead. It was called Hammerhead at the time I did, and then it came on. Hammers were involved. Hammers, Maybe heads. Hammers and heads were there. Those were a duffel bag. <laughs> and I actually got my head hit with the hammer from Hammerhead. Oh, stunt bump. And I got hit. I got hit with a with a rubber sledgehammer, and right in the neck. And that was the one that they ended up using for 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 camera, but the film wow. the film never ended up. Now, getting, were you doing that as a non-union talent? Or yeah, was yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know what the union was really at that time. Yeah. You know, this is in two thousand and eight. Okay. Yeah, we were out there on set, and you know, it was it was nice. And they were they had shot part of a movie that was about sixty minutes long, and they needed another 20 minutes to kind of flesh it out and make it full feature length, you know, so it could be sold and distributed. Yeah. And, um, so, so what led you to Hollywood? Well, after the dead walk, I knew I was going to Hollywood. I just didn't know how. Gotcha. So that was sometime in like middle of, middle of the late 2006 when all that was going on. And then I knew I was going out there. I just didn't know how. And, um, you know, things developed and, um, 
I was talking back and forth with uh, my cousin, Marisha Ray, and uh, she was ended up going to school in um, uh, Pittsburgh. Now, Marisha Ray, we should know that name because... Because um, she's like all over the place in the video game world and uh, the Dungeons and Dragons world uh, with her husband, uh, Matt Mercer, and uh, extremely successful. So gamers know who she is. Gamers. uh, Clearly, I'm not one. (laughs) Of uh, video game expertise and also uh, tabletop, which is like more of your, you know, board games and uh, Dungeons and Dragons type stuff. Which my made son founded a Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, my son huge actually resurgence. founded a Dungeons and Dragons club at uh, Syracuse University. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was actually taught um, um, rules of the game by uh, co-creator um, Dave Arneson. Oh, okay. And he signed my rule cyclopedia, so that was <laughs> nice. really nice. Yeah, I went back and consulted with him. And talk to him a little bit about his idea and wanted to get a little bit of one-on-one with him in a one-hour meeting after I graduated. And um, Very cool. Yeah, very nice guy. Rest in peace. So how did you get to Hollywood? I keep asking you this question. Oh, so yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I'd come back for, for Christmas and stuff and I'm chatting with the family, you know, chatting back with- in Kentucky? With, yeah, with, with, okay. with Marisha and-, and uh, and I'm close with her dad, you know, right. uh, Uncle Mark, and um, you know, and um, her her mother, and and all that. And they're you know taking trips back and forth to uh, you know uh, New York and stuff for auditions, and right. you know going through classes and and prepping, and you know ballet and the whole nine yards. You know, really uh, really immersed. Um, and the arts and stuff with Marisha and, and letting her go down that path. And, um, and we were just kind of talking and she's like, yeah, I got, um, an agent came out to Pittsburgh and saw me putting a, a show on. And he was like, you know, you need to just like quit school and just move on out to, to LA. I'll represent you and, uh, we'll go from there. But at some point, you've got to go. You, you just have to. You, right. You, you can't waste any more time, and you have to go out now, because if you don't go out now, it's never going to happen. Which it may happen, but we need you to go now, and you need to go now. You, you, your dreams, <laughs> your dreams can't wait. So what'd you do? Well, she went out, and and she um, she got situated, and uh, her folks helped her she uh, get situated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She jumped. Mm-hmm. When 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 she got the that's the thing about Marisha is that when she when she gets an opportunity she she goes for it. she's you know she's she's there and uh, she's been doing that for a for a long time very long time and uh, she had uh, basically kind of uh, you know got established out in Hollywood and she told me a little bit about it and uh, she told me that there were street performers on Hollywood Boulevard dressed as the Joker, uh, making an honest living. And I said, well, I'll see you as soon as I can basically get these one plus two plus three together, you know, and because uh, if anybody else can do it, I can do it. I know how to put together a costume. I know my art. I can put together a costume. I can, uh, my hair's already long. I know how to do makeup. Back then. Yeah. yeah. Back then. Yeah. Back in 2008. But it, this was this was in this was the uh, Christmas of two thousand and seven. Okay, that we were discussing all, all this, and I was like, okay, this is cool, and stuff's kind of going on, and we don't know how necessarily because yeah, and she did the Dark gotten, Knight had just come out at that point, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, the Dark Knight is still kind of fresh. It was a little bit after, of course, Heath had yeah. passed, and um. But yeah, it just one thing leads to another, and then you know you, when you pursue stuff by taking that step, you you set that into motion. You set it into motion, and you if you act on it, the next foot just kind of comes afterwards. But if you never take that first step, it, you know you're going to have a really hard time. So you acted on it. You came to Hollywood. Yeah, I don't have a choice. I, I, a man with nothing has nothing to lose. So, and that's what I originally yeah. wanted to do. So, you know, there's no time like the present, even you know, back then. It still isn't. You know, we have to always keep that level of freshness inside of us and uh, being comfortable being uncomfortable. 
So what was it like working as Joker, as a busker, a street performer on Hollywood Boulevard? It was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was some of my most uh, fond memories of Hollywood. Um, getting acclimated to the uh, audition technique and, and, and going and making my own living and having my own apartment complex that I'd played for completely on my own with no roommates, right. uh, being my own boss, uh, building my confidence in that way. And, um, so you're effectively running your own business. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't realize that you're running your own business as an actor or any other, anything else in entertainment, uh, you're really mistaken, correct? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because if you're not running it, someone's going to be running it, and now you're an employee. Well, you're just not going to make it. You're just not, not going to make the cut because other people aren't going to waste their time. Exactly. Now, at some point, uh, Iron Man came into the picture. How did that – what was the transition from uh, from Joker to, to Iron Man? Well, I have this human condition. It's called always wanting more. Uh, <laughs> we're all kind of like damned You're with. the only one. No, I'm the only one. Uh, I'm the only human here. <laughs> At least in this room. No, just right. kidding. How you doing, Oliver? Don't kill me. Dude, I'm not supposed to know he's in here. Ollie, anyway. is a, Ollie is a presence, but he's he's just he's hovering over the board. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you want to do something better. Uh, the, the makeup, being on the skin all the time, is it clogs up the pores. and Right. You know. Uh, I can remember from doing Beetlejuice that one time. It's it's Yeah. It's crazy. And, you know, and you're doing your own makeup too. So yeah, I was doing my own makeup, doing you, it, but then having to deal with it on your skin and do it and have it on my skin and you know having the green in my hair all the time. I didn't dye the hair; I just mm -hmm. put the green makeup in the hair and okay, you know, and uh, doing the voice and um, you know playing essentially the devil, you know, yeah. on a day to day basis. Of course, you have to play it kind of as a, still as a as a comedic way. You know, right. on, the, on the sidewalk because you have to make people laugh and you have to f find some type of way to be not creepy, uh, not too creepy to where you don't make any money and yet be able to, if someone is interested in, in your personality as, you as yourself. You got to be legitimate. You got to deliver this believable then character. You have to, then, you can, then you get an opportunity to go into it and say, okay, well, I'm going to do an impersonation of Heath Ledger, yeah. you know, at this uh, close intimate range, which no one else is going to be able to. To, to give and he shared it was like a pretty grueling and intense experience for oh, himself it's, to it's do iconic it. yeah. i mean you know it's it just i don't know it's just a probably the best joker probably of all time and you know it's easy to say that now because he's he's not with us anymore but i mean i can go back and watch that movie anytime and just go yeah so scared i just i because he's just like you know, point. that Joker guy, he's just, like my, this is what my dad said. He says, well, he's not to be messed with. <laughs> right. And he did that after uh, uh, Jack Nicholson's performance, which was yeah. was classic and iconic. So yeah. that was a, a tough uh, tough act to follow, and he did it. Sure, absolutely. He made it his own. Yeah. So what, um, how did Iron Man come about? Well, not wanting to do the makeup. You know, I can hide underneath the mask. Nobody will ever know who I am. Um, this was, uh, Iron Man had just come out in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so it was the beginning of 2009 when I arrived in Hollywood, January 5th, 2009. Going through, I was like, oh, I want to do something better. I want to do something better. You know, I tried other characters. I tried Gambit from the Wolverine Origins movie. And it was just <laughs> like not enough screen time. I started figuring out yeah. what in pop culture, what makes people respond right. in the, the general public? How do you come through all of the mediocrity because there's a lot of noise emerge? out there well there's a lot of noise the there Boulevard. always has been a lot of noise but yeah. there was less noise at that time um in different ways but if you're performing a character as a busker as a costume character you got to do something that is going to grab people's attention you have to do what what the general public likes not what you like right that's the way yeah. i explain <laughs> exactly. it to people you know you don't get to go out yeah. there and get to do um um you know, uh, even something as popular as like Sailor Moon. I mean, it's like, yeah, if you're not in the anime world, you don't know what Sailor Moon is, even but though it's, it is it's fairly it is iconic. Sailor it's she's <laughs> like a space princess thing. Okay, you know, and really big in anime. Sorry, anime. My son probably knows. He he loves anime. So yeah, I'll ask him. It's like a quintessential thing of anime, like a side Akira. Okay, um, but. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, so you got SpongeBob, you got even Mario doesn't doesn't make it out there on his own. Like he'll he'll make a certain amount, but you know, you gotta have something like SpongeBob or something that's new, like a Pokemon did well right there when Pokemon yeah. Go came out, and then it, it came and went. No, so you could do a mainstream, you know, probably. Uh, 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 I don't know what's that thing that they're all playing now Fortnite. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe that would work probably you not know, just cuz it's not it's popular among the gamer community but it hasn't emerged in a feature film where it's been shown to the general public that it's going to really really have that ingrained into right. the psyche of of the American people. You know, are 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 even for the more into the world because you're dealing with an international market out on Hollywood Boulevard of the people that you're trying to attract to what you're doing. So, for example, a friend of mine would do Napoleon Dynamite. A lot of the Americans loved it. Right. But it never got an international distribution deal. So, hmm. the Japanese just didn't know what the hell it was. They just thought it was some really <laughs> nerdy ass dude out there, you know, asking for a dollar. Right. You know, so um, I knew Iron Man was already a super success. I loved the movie. It was just a lot of fun. It's standalone. Forget all the rest of the superhero stuff. Kind of caught everyone by surprise a little bit because no one really knew how uh, it was early days for Marvel back then. Uh, it's, Correct. It's hard to remember that now because it's other than X Men. So there yeah. was no success with Marvel, which is actually that's Fox, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, X Men was Fox. Yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so. So you do an Iron Man. So yeah, you know, how am I going to get an Iron Man costume? They're, they they don't exist, you know. Yeah, right. They don't exist. In 2010, there's no Iron Man costumes out there. There's one guy, and there was a guy named uh, Timeless Movie Props, and uh, he had an Iron Man suit, and um, he he wouldn't sell to me because um, I was going to use it to basically to to make a living. And uh, little did I know he'd Why been served he? a cease and a cease and desist by. Uh, Marvel already. Oh, really? Yeah. So I didn't even know wow. that, but I later found that out going yeah. on down the the pipeline. I was on this uh, website called uh, um, uh, what's that movie? What's that website called? Uh, t uh, the RPF, the Replica Prop Forum. Okay. And uh, you know, just finding out, and a friend of mine was a, a stormtrooper, also a Batman at the time. Mm -hmm. um, he. Uh, kind of told me, says, yeah, dude, you know, this is what you're into. This is what it's going to cost if you want to get this thing made. It's going to be around, you know, anywhere between $3,000 to $5,000. He's like, dude, these guys don't have this stuff just sitting cheap. on a rack. Yeah, right. These guys don't have this stuff sitting on the rack. They have to custom make it for you, yeah. you know, and they have to go and paint it and all the stuff right. that's involved. You got to understand. And so he had a, a sand trooper costume and he's like, here, dude. Put on a sand trooper costume so you get an idea of what it's like to be in an armor. Mm. And I was like wearing this. I was like, dude, this ain't like this ain't like the Joker. <laughs> you know, being That's out up. there in, in, in a costume, it's just just made out of cloth as compared to wearing you know plastic armor. Right. You know, it's you're it's wearing a, armor, whether it's, it's plastic or move. not. It's difficult to move. Yeah. You're just uh, you're in a helmet. Your vision's limited and. Is it suffocating? Like, do you feel your sure, wow. sure, absolutely? I mean, I'm I'm extremely claustrophobic. <laughs> oh, really? Absolutely, wow. yeah. And I had to get and yet over you it. You did it anyways, huh? You don't have a choice. Wow. Not if you not if there's something that you want, and there's something that you want to achieve. You have to face your fear and yeah. you know get That's on with crazy. it. You know, you're an entrepreneur. You're out there doing crazy stuff. So make it happen. So I want to get some of the other things uh, to talk about here. What happened? Were you able to get that costume, or you get a different one, or What's yeah, I ended up finding a guy in Vegas that was already prototyping one. Okay. And it turned out that one was a lot better, lighter. Oh, and, cool. And, uh, you know, it was just phenomenal. Um, okay. Dark Asylum uh, props, uh, miles and miles above anything that was out there at the time. And nice. I just, I rocked it for a long time. People were like still in the photos and stuff online and, and ripping people <laughs> off from the photos that I was in when the suit yeah. got completed and the photos were taken. And it's impressive to see you in that suit. Thank you. It's very impressive. It's just, it's you're like, wow, it's a new. Yeah, it's a, a Mark III replica, the original yeah. Iron Man. You know, I was getting it commissioned right before Iron Man 2 came out. And I'm going to tell you, um, the suit finally got done. It was like a, a month after Iron Man 2 had come out in the mm -hmm. theaters. And I'm going to tell you, I was slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, out in Vegas. I was just <laughs> boom, 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 boom. One photo, one photo. I mean, that's the, the height. 
that's the complete height of of any lifetime of of any character that comes out is when the sequel comes out. Right. Everybody's been waiting. They know part right, two's exactly. coming out. And they're pent up. They're marketing it, and they're yeah. done. And I want to see what he's going to do next. And oh, right. it's just so interesting. The last one was kick ass, and you know. So you did it in Vegas as well as in in Hollywood. Correct. But in Hollywood, uh, you had kind of a run in with the city of L.A., didn't you? You that is correct. Yeah, that's why I was actually out in Vegas at the time. I was trying to. uh, What happened in LA? I was raising money, uh, you know, finishing out, you know, doing the Joker because I found out earlier that you could go to Vegas and Vegas was actually a lot better than Hollywood. And uh, for busking, for for busking. I was actually back then and I was actually, um, I was out there and I got a phone call from the guy who was uh, Batman and gave me the. uh, Tony Tommy, mm-hmm. and he said, "Hey man, there are just a lot of guys out here, man, and they're arresting all the characters, man. You should be out here, man. It's a lot of fun, you know." And I was, um, they're arresting the characters. Yeah, yeah, in L.A. Yeah, they're just arresting them, man. I, 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 I got for what? What were they arresting them for? I don't know, man. Just for being characters, I guess, man. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. that, that's kind of. That's kind of what it was, and uh, um, I just said to uh, my girlfriend at the time, I said, uh, do you want to go back to Hollywood and get arrested? <laughs> you know, and she said, like any good girlfriend would, sure, honey, whatever you want to do. Nice. And uh, it was me, and then uh, I'm another friend of mine that, does, uh, that did Wolverine, and we all three ended up getting arrested. Um, while you're performing your first came amendment protected from, right to uh, engage in came back from LA uh, free speech, came back from Vegas into Hollywood on yes. public property yep on city streets and they gave me the Sidewalks. opportunity to go straight to jail and they gave them the opportunity to walk away the character stuff is done out here wow and um and what year know, was this this was in 2010 in uh, okay. uh June so, right so before, right before tour season was getting eight ready to years ago. Off. Eight years ago, yeah. correct. And then uh, we we had our criminal charges dropped, and um, and then we took it to Carol Sobel, who was um, Matt Wolverine's um, one of his uh, drop offs when he was a motorcycle courier, okay. and um, she decided to take our case because he just knew her through, you know. And I just knew I had a feeling that, you know, what's going on is not right. And yeah. if I don't if I don't do something about it, then my my personal living is going to be compromised and my dreams of pursuing Hollywood is going to be So you guys sued the city. Correct. And we yeah. won. Nice. And uh you know, that's why we have, you know, any and everybody out there on Hollywood Boulevard today. That's a big a it's, big win for buskers. It's a big win. It's also a big lose if you look at what's out there right now. Yeah, well, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a freedom of speech. It's America. That's what makes it great, right? Yeah. It, do you get a sense that since that, the city felt a little stung by the settlement they had to pay out? That's what Carol Sobel told us that wouldn't happen. Yeah. That the city would wash their hands and... Because um, it really feels like the city is just completely abandoned. Uh what they call the Hollywood Entertainment District, Hollywood Boulevard between Orange and Highland. Well, you let it go for such a long time and then you got to come back in. Then there's a whole lot more work to be done and it's not yeah. going to get fixed overnight like anything else. You let something go. It's like, yeah. well, you've got, you know, 10 years of uh, 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 dirty clothes that, you know, you haven't done. So you're not going to get through it all in one day. You're going to have to, you know, spend a Is certain it- amount of money to go get the quarters, go down there and wash it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, right, then the right. landlord's going to kick you out at 11 p.m. Yeah. And you've got to have another whole day at it, and then you got to fold them. Now, you were in a film that one of our no, previous guests, was, Michael... That's untrue. Right. One of our previous guests, uh, Ross Michael J- uh, Johnson, who does Wolverine, he was also in called Anger Anonymous. Tell us a little bit about that. Anger Anonymous was a project that uh, Ross Johnson came up with with a couple other people, and we're all characters on the boulevard, and uh, I thought it'd be cool to kind of come up with something that's uh, kind of cheeky and gets to show the characters, uh, character impersonators, do something wacky involving their characters in a, in a comedy-type manner that uh, could just be like a good venture, something 
comedy that could go out there and maybe do something good on the internet and try right. to try to go viral with it and have some fun along the way. And so I signed on to it and I thought it was I thought it was a good idea. All right. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, you're also you're studying as an actor. I understand you would, uh, went to the Chubbuck studio. Yes, that's that's true. That's the first studio that I went to. Tell and, us a little and, bit about that. Um, there was an actress um, that I had met um, in Hollywood. Her name is Dina Summer, and uh, I met her in 2009. And she was, um, she was telling me all about you know this world renowned um, acting coach, you know Ivana Chubbuck. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, wow, really cool. I was like, well, man, I'd like to, I'd like to go to that school too because I want to, you know, I want to be trained by the best, you know, and. Right. Um, I got into the um, the beginner's class. I don't know. She, she might have got in at probably the uh, the intermediate, not the master. Okay. Uh, she might have got into the master. I'm, I'm not really 100% sh- uh, clear on that. But, um, yeah, that was my uh, introduction to uh, uh, method acting. Nice. Yes, sir. And you put that method acting and other acting to good use. You were in the Great Depression. Oh, uh, well, that was called the Old Winter. Oh, I see. Okay. But I changed I changed gotcha. the name of it so that I didn't like kind of like um it wouldn't come up on the on the the search results and stuff like that. But uh so yeah, I'll probably go that. back and I'll probably go back and change that back to the old winner though. Okay. Yeah, it was a great uh, uh project that um that I was lucky to book from uh booking a project uh with the Chapman thesis. Uh Chapman's out in the Orange County. They do a lot of really great, phenomenal um, uh, film school out there. A lot of really great work. Uh, shot Jeremy, which I had cornrows in. You had cornrows. I had cornrows. Played kind of like a, a, a high desert, uh, wannabe gangster, you know, uh, Eminem meets Kid Rock type of dude. <laughs> okay. And um, that project was a really uh, great project. Had a lot of esteem, and I ended up sending the director of The Old Winter um, – the 30 minute film Jeremy and he cast me as Jack Pruitt in The Old Winter oh nice okay okay that's how that happened so proud Jeremy what about a Manifest Mind what was that Manifest Mind um, was a USC um, well partially a USC student film it was actually not considered a student film because um, it was uh, one that she was uh, doing in between her two theses at uh, USC uh, Mercedes Bryce Morgan, director, um, and uh, Manifest Mind just kind of s- stuck out to me, and uh, I wasn't even really submitting a lot uh, at the time, and I saw that come down the pipeline, I think, on L.A. Casting, and I just, I paid out of pocket to submit to it because the name caught me, the name was catchy. Right. And it's important to have a catchy name. <laughs> And uh, I submitted for it, and it was something, the role was kind of like right up my alley, stuff that I'd played before. So it was kind of like low-hanging fruit. So I just went in, I said, well, if I can manifest my mind to get this part, then I won't quit acting. <laughs> right. Well, you, you were thinking about quitting? Oh, yeah. It's something really? you think about a lot as an actor. You're just like, oh, you know what? Guess what? Today, I'm fucking quitting. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. There's kids here. No, okay. there's actually no kids here. Just no kids. This is totally Mark explicit, so you can, <laughs> you can say all of Carlin's dirty words and then some new ones he never thought of. I'm not supposed to say the F word. I'm sorry, guys. You can fucking say fuck, Paul. I give okay. you. <laughs> okay. I give you dispensation, special or otherwise. So that, you know, that that worked out great. And, um, you know, funny enough, um, Mercedes Bryce Morgan went on to direct um, Stargate Origins. So, oh, wow. You know. My manifest mind uh, had keyed into something that was, uh, you know, next level stuff. And she's she's tearing it up. She's doing all kinds of stuff, doing marshmallow videos and just uh, on fire. Very uh, nice. Uh, nice up and coming talent. And I saw recently you were in The Hollywood Reporter. Yes, that's true. Uh, um, for the, a film that I guess is in production right now, Silent Life. That's correct. So tell us about that. Well, it's a Rudolph Valentino period piece. It's uh, nice. It's uh, got a lot of really interesting stuff that deals with um, Hollywood and the the ideas of Hollywood, and uh, the dues that people take to make it, and and uh, of course about Rudy, people that mm-hmm. Rudy knew. But it adds a lot of uh, 
elements into it that just are about Hollywood in general and about how, you know, there's a million people out here and there's a couple that make it. And uh, there's a lot of stories about the, uh, the, the, the walk of shame and, mm. you know, and uh, I got to play uh, silent film actor uh, Norman Carey. So that was oh, uh, okay, cool. That was a nice, nice thing I got to be involved in. And you got a few films, uh, and also it looks like some TV, Blackstone in development. Are you at liberty to discuss any of these? Because <laughs> sometimes well, you're not. Uh, Blackstone, um, I play a uh, coal mine manager in that, and um, 1920s, and uh, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, it's it's still you know in development. Mm-hmm. Um, I did some pretty deep auditions for that. And there was a, like a long, like a, there was a 10 minute audition that I had uh, put together for them. And, uh, they told me that, uh, I was out of the five people that they auditioned for that part that I was, you know, that I did a good job. Well played. Well played. Nice. And then, uh, can you discuss it all? Vermont street, Orchid Avenue or Green Oaks drive. I'm noticing a trend there. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Well, um, those films are um, are currently in, de- in the script development, and uh, this guy's just wanted to do a, a whole lot of everything, and uh, he's gotten a lot. Of, he just writes and writes and writes and writes and writes. He's got a lot of uh, – it just naturally comes out of him. He just, you know, some writers have a problem with writer's block, and this guy doesn't. And uh, He's prolific. He's just, he's just got the gift, oh, and cool. um, you know we're excited to see how it's going. He's he's got some other writers and stuff that are on board with it and helping him tighten it up. And um, nice. So it's nice to see that uh, collaboration come in, which is always crucial in the film world. Sure. So what else is on the plate here? I have coming a up. film coming up um, called The Most Beautiful by Rachel Irene Wilk and um, I was casting that that's also through f- uh, Chapman and uh, I'm really looking forward to it um, what do you play? well I don't really want to go into too much more discussion about okay, it that's, because it's understood, it's, understood. Uh, it could be crucial but uh, that. it's going to come out it's only, it's only uh, it's a short film it's only going to be about 11 minutes long okay. but um, it's kind of exciting though when you got something that you know it's important enough that you know you're not at liberty to discuss I don't want to give away you know? too much you got to have secrets in the uh, oh absolutely I'm a huge believer in the basket yeah well I mean it's like the whole point of where you, if you're involved in creating you know a, a work of art or entertainment it's going to touch on that, some really sensitive issues and really? it's a um, I'm playing a role you want that, people to enjoy it, you know? You don't want to, like, rob them by, like... Okay, I'll tell you this. So, it's kind of like a um, an edgier type of role, like 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 Kip from... Gritty. Uh, yeah, it's 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 gritty, and it's 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 going to be challenging for me. And uh, that's what I like to do. I uh-huh. like to do stuff that's challenging, and, and, it, and I like to try to really work with the director and really get down and... and develop this thing together that that we're, we're both really really proud of and, and and just tell this story that that needs to be told in a um in a time that that we need these stories to be told you know, with with the climate of everything else that's going on in the world so that's what i like about 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 film is that we have a responsibility to society to try to help move things along and and get people involved it's like Ro- Roger Ebert you know, used to say, you know, films uh, basically gives us the capacity to have empathy. So, yeah, I'm grateful that you're uh, you're part of that process, creating more empathy out there as a as a working Amen. actor, Paul. Thank you, Mark. Paul Lewis Harold, did we do it? I think we covered all the bases here. I think we did. Thank you all very right. much for having me on, Mark. Oh, my pleasure, pleasure, brother. My Thank pleasure. You. Paul Lewis Harold. Good guy, man. It's a good buddy of mine. That was a good interview. We didn't get into the fact that uh, we've got a new Iron Man now that's part of the uh, the Hollywood Avengers, which actually formed after uh, Paul was uh, doing uh, Iron Man the most. He's so busy with uh, acting gigs now, but I think he, he, he might see him every once in a while. But uh, I do know that uh, he and our new Iron Man, uh, they get along very well, and uh, it's kind of like the... 
the mantle or the torch has been passed on, as it were, which is good, which is good. And if you want to check out the latest on Paul Lewis Harrell, go to paullewisharrell.com. It's Paul, P-A-U-L, Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, Harrell, H-A-R-R, E-L-L dot com and you can get the latest going on in the world's of Paul. He's got a lot of cool productions coming up. I, I want to see see him in some of this stuff coming up here. The show notes are at markromanempire.com That's where you can get the links, other groovy stuff that's mentioned during the show. It's seriously, do you guys read the show notes? You can tell me. Let me know. Romanpodmail at gmail.com. Thanks to our listeners across the globe. I see you from Los Angeles to San Jose to Hawaii to Dallas to Atlanta to O oh, Canada to Ireland. Okay, I know that was probably Scottish. I don't know. All right, I can't do those accents. To Norway and even Mother Russia. But we expected Russian monitoring. Too soon? You can listen to the podcast on Mixcloud, Podbean, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, and on TuneIn. Apparently, just episodes two through nine. Yeah, I don't know why either, but inquiries have been made. There's even an Apple Music hack until we get into the store. We're working on it. MarkRomanEmpire.com. Click listen, and more platforms are in progress. Do you want special deals? Join my mailing list, the Mark Roman Empire Census. What kind of deals? Well, last week, census members enjoyed two for one on my poem, Son of Elmer Gantry's Bitch, autographed. What deal will be this week? Whatever it is, it will only be available to those of you included in the Mark Roman Empire census. To join the census, go to markromanempire.com and click census. Twitter at the Mark Roman, Instagram as ever at Vegas nine zero two one zero. You can email me at the podcast at RomanPodMail at gmail dot com. Kind of getting used to the new uh, the new digs here at the Musicians Institute. I like it. I like it a lot. I like being able to walk to my work. Is this work? Can I call this work? Is that cool? Can we call it work? Let's call it work. I'm okay. Let's call work. I don't know. I get, get a little touchy. That whole LinkedIn thing. It kind of, I don't know, rubbed me raw, you know, as the Joker used to say. Never touch another man's rhubarb. I still don't know what that means, but that's okay. Until next week, don't be Courtney Fast. And remember Clownolin and Prince St. Paul. I am the Mark Roman.